Welcome everybody to another session of the Governance Education Series. Today we are joined by Daniel Ospina from Arendau, who will be talking about fund allocation from community vote to team to team. Welcome, Daniel. Thank you, Fim. It's good to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, for those who, who don't know me, I'm, I'm Daniel. I'm a co-instigator of Arendau. We are a research and development DAO we research DAO operations and DAO governance, and then incubate the DAO tooling as well. So I'm going to be sharing a little bit about some thoughts that are somewhat grounded on the, the research and previous work i done uh, designing the governance of a few different DAOs and so on. But they're mostly uh, sort of like experimental ideas and the, what we're sort of trying to create in Arendau at the moment. These are not like officially agreed. This is more simply my vision and some of the things I'm, I'm exploring. Uh, I'll, I can share quite a bit about the background of that as is rooted upon some trends that I'm seeing both in the way DAOs are evolving, a little bit based on systems theory and some of those fundamentals, but also very, very rooted in some of the, let's say the innovative examples of corporations that are doing things differently and the direction they're going. And, and what I'm seeing is that from these three different data points or groups of data points is that they are converging towards something in the middle that, that looks quite exciting. And, and so I'm going to share a little bit how I see that happening. And, and that's uh, in practice with the example of Arendau, which, as I was saying, we're doing different projects. So Arendau works as a, as a platform, if you like, with multiple units on top. And, and so the, the different units are almost like autonomous projects. You could call them so, sub-DAOs. You could call them guilds, pods, whatever it is. Uh, but the important thing is that they are kind of like their own ventures. And uh, Are you seeing my, my screen as I'm sharing? Yep. All right, cool. Yeah, so uh, that's me. So the, when designing governance, the question to start is, what is it that we're governing? And in our case, we are governing some funds. And that's the, the main topic of the talk. I'm going to be uh, going into some of the ideas around that. But we're also governing the strategy, what gets done, or if you like, attention, and what things get, uh, get paid uh, attention to. I'll, I'll go a little bit more into that nuance, or at least how I'm thinking about it, and then would love to hear your, you folks what you think about that. Then there is operational decisions, so actually the technical day-to-day -day decisions that are being done across these different teams, and of course the, the meta-governance of how do we decide what we decide. And so moving into financial governance, we have the traditional fund allocation, this is like the way corporations do it. So each department pitches a budget, and then the executives gather, negotiate, and decide whether it's the CEO or, or the board making a, uh, a vote. That's usually the mechanism. And what we have the, the so somewhat first generation of DAOs doing is each department or each unit or each person pitches a budget, and then the community votes on that. And, and so they, some of the consequences of that in traditional fund allocations, let's go from that side, is that each person only has rich context about their unit. So the marketing person has a lot of context about what's happening in marketing, but when the HR person asks for a 10% increase in their budget, the marketing person doesn't really know why, and vice versa. And Or, let, or if the, the organization is divided, uh, let's say, by product, and the people from product A don't understand why the, the people from product B are asking for, um, for a higher budget, or at least the managers of those different units don't understand why the, the leader or the lead or whatever it is, the representative of the other unit is asking for that budget increase. The other, the other challenge, which is a little bit deeper, is that when you're trying to do those things, you're like when you're budgeting, you're mixing together a whole bunch of different processes, because quite often what gets funding means what gets done, and what doesn't get funding means what doesn't get fund. So you're deciding the overall strategy for the organization. And you might have had decided some of the strategy before, but this gives a new arena in, in which the, the real strategy to, uh, to some degree is going to be redecided. 
and, and discuss and actually made into practice. So if some people disagree or simply didn't understood or for whatever reason, they weren't fully aligned with any idea, any idea of what the strategy was, the, the investment decision is a new opportunity to, to change that to, or at least to really set it up in stone and figure out what's actually gonna happen. Then you're also trying to predict what the, what the future is, because you're quite often you're deciding those budgets and this is not yet the situation with DAOs because most DAOs are pre-revenue or generating very limited revenue, except perhaps for noun, da noun DAOs and so on. But most DAOs are just making decisions based on the treasury they have and not necessarily on revenue. But as the market becomes more, more efficient, most likely we're going to start to have a uh, better allocation of capital, which means that instead of having these huge idle treasuries, people are going to be generating some revenue and trying to spend that revenue to continue growing and developing the organization. And so in doing, you're trying to forecast how much revenue you're going to get, because then that gives you an idea of how much you can invest and, and, and so on. And, and so when you are allocating the budget, these oh, these forecasting can also very much come into play and is often not separated as another activity and then the other thing that you're that you're talking about is that if you get a bigger budget and again this is still the traditional world but if you get a bigger budget then that means that you're uh, a more important manager and you can put it in your cv you actually put the budget that you manage or the number of people that you manage and so on and, and so it's a career development arena which naturally leads to infighting so the marketing people fight with the hr people for for who gets the the same budget and it can be quite hard to align incentives and so you end up with a lot of sub optimization where everyone is trying to make the best marketing department possible but not necessarily the best possible organization and in, instead of that, with the, the sort of first generation DAO funding allocation mechanism that uh, I was talking about, what we have is that the people making decisions have even less context than the managers in a closely tight organization. Because so, you have a lot of community members who are partially engaged, who might, you don't necessarily know who they are. And especially if they are small holders, like if they don't have a lot of tokens, their, the incentive for them to participate and vote is quite low in the sense that if they have, let's say, $10 worth of tokens and they're going to make a decision that might impact the value of the tokens by 10% in a pure economic argument, that means that they have $1 budget to invest. And okay, $10 is very, very low, but let's say they have $1,000, a 10% impact decision, which is actually a huge decision, they will only have a hundred dollar budget and a hundred dollars base case scenario maybe it pays for two hours three hours or something like that depending on where they're based but it doesn't really afford you a lot of time until you have to invest more time than what the decision is worth for you so you're then purely relying on emotional incentives and so on and community sort of feeling to justify participation and that's quite hard to do so by the nature of that, that means that a lot of the people deciding, they are investing very little time investigating each decision. And we're still mixing uh, the strategy with forecasting, with the career security and career development, because most of the people making proposals, they're making them for themselves and so on. And so that means that it's actually like a very complex process where many, many perspectives and many different needs of different people are coming into it with little context. And the, the unfortunate output of a lot of these is that we, we can very easily degenerate into populism. So you can make proposals that are very designed to get likes, essentially, but are not necessarily the most impactful proposal. Like we see in uh, traditional government quite often, people pr promote things that appeal to the masses, but are not necessarily well thought out. And some of the experts might complain, but the masses might listen more to influencers rather than the experts, and it doesn't necessarily lead to very good decisions, either model. So the, so, so we're trying to think, okay, like, is there an, an alternative to these top-down fund allocation? And by top-down, I'm referring to both models, where you have a single mechanism within the organization, within the, within the community that is used to emit the funds and they're distributed from that. Cause then what happens is a sort of uh, Roi Soleil, like Sun King, in, if you think like France, uh, Louis XV sort of thing, 
where everyone is going around that power source, figuring out how to get the budget, which is not necessarily the sort of behavior you want to encourage. You don't want to encourage people spending loads of time internally campaigning for proposals, and you don't want to spend loads of time trying to cut deals and making relationships with the other managers and so on. What you want is, yes, there needs to be a good strategy, and that can be figured out collectively with input of different people, but you want to spend most of the time with people actually looking at who are the customers or who are the, the users of this thing and trying to deliver value for them. In an ideal world, in DAO, sometimes they're a little bit the same people, but because of the economic incentives, the users being the workers only, only works in, let's say, a, a minority of cases, like it's a thin Venn diagram, and unless everyone is part-time and things like that, but it gets complicated. So kind of what I'm saying is that if, for that central uh, central point that is distributing funds with a top-down mechanism, we can replace that, then maybe we could have some, some better allocation, uh, some better financial governance. So in that, the one of the key things is if we want to do that, a, a big part is about incentives, but the other big part is about context, is do people have the necessary information to make these decisions? And so, because of this, there has been roughly two strategies that are usually used, and one is becoming quite popular, which is the sub-DAO thing, divide and conquer, fractalization. So we're going to allocate a small pot of, of funding to someone, uh, to, a, to a team, to a guild, to a pod, and then this unit is going to further subdivide it. And so they can have a lot more of that local context, that specialization, that continuity in looking after the decision, let's say learning from the first season and then going to another season or from one month to another and over time. And that can help uh, lead to better decisions or at least iteration and small experiments, which can then be scaled, which is uh, quite often a more, uh, more effective way to manage finan financial capital in an uncertain environment. The other strategy, which is the, the peer-to-peer platform thinking mutualization sort of thing, is what uh, I'm about to, to explain that we're experimenting with. So in, in, a, in if instead of having a single mechanism that is giving funds, you can try to have these different units, and the different units are operating as a network. So let's say this is uh, actually in our, in our case, in our endow, so we can have uh, a recruitment unit that is providing a service to a community health product that we have. There is another governance research initiative that is being supported by the marketing communication sort of one, and is also being supported by the business develop by a business development unit. And these different units are also working between them and so on. So we can have the Meet with Wallet, which is another product that we have and is being supported by Marcoms and so on. So we actually have this network of relationships within the organization where these different units are already providing value to one another. So if instead of us trying to understand how this network of value is operating and trying to quantify it from a centralized uh, point a centralized distribution system or you know a community vote which again for for the sake of this argument is a single place where you do it what if instead we can eliminate that layer for most decisions delegate responsibility directly to the units so that then where each of them is deciding for themselves what they need and they don't need from the network as a whole in a provision of value so then that leads us to this sort of uh, unit-to-unit -unit budgeting that is a, a market-based coordination mechanism. So each unit has its own profit and loss. Each unit operates as a, as a business, if you like, in its own right. Uh, the units buy and sell from one another products, services, other forms of value provision. Ideally, the units can also invest in one another and, and have some sort of mutual credit system, but that's, uh, uh, let's say, next generation, a little bit more advanced. We'll maybe explore that in the future. And then what you end up with is that the, the strategy ends up being created, not so, mu not so much as something that is being decided from the, from the top level uh, decision-making mechanism, because you have actually decentralized that, but it ends up being deci uh, decided as a stick merge. So, 
when some people start going somewhere, others can follow. When there is some signals of like, hey, this play, there is value in this direction or something like that, or this unit actually provides great value, then other units might go in that same direction. So let's say if there is an if there is an opportunity that that is spotted and some people start are to try to start units and different businesses to go after that opportunity, if some of them find great support from some uh, internal internal team that is doing recruitment, they they will talk about it. That relationship will be celebrated, and others will go also to that same recruitment unit and say, "Hey, can you also provide me recruitment services?" And then the other bit about it of the strategy, this strategy system, is that it's very much based on entrepreneurship. So let's say that there is loads of units that are trying to figure out their marketing and no one is offering the marketing services. Someone comes around, is like, hey, what if I start a unit that is performing marketing services? And instead of having to get the community as a whole to agree with these, uh, instead of having to get some executive or some manager or even some delegates to agree with these, all they need to do is find a client within the organization and they can start to use the different protocols and rules within the organization and they become essentially a new unit within the organization that is providing value to the others through um, a buy and sell, essentially a market-based coordination system. So there is uh, a few different organizations that have been coming at these, like, for example, Sappos that was later acquired by, by Amazon. After they move, uh, they move away from Holacracy, they went into something that resembled more of these. There is Hire, which is a, a very well-known uh, white goods corporate Chinese corporation that is becoming quite trendy in Web3 as they, they have all sorts of really advanced organization design that they've been doing for many years. Uh, and, and and a range of other different organizations in, in Web2 has been have been trying this, but this also mimics what in general the DAO ecosystem is doing, where we have all of these primarily autonomous units that are buying and selling products to each other, even though they are tiny startups, the majority of them. So through some fractalization, you can help to facilitate those transactions if you can incubate a series of capabilities within uh, this DAO or meta DAO or this community that, that are really, really essential to facilitate this. Because as we know, market-based mechanisms can be a little bit brutal in the with the invisible hand of the market and so on. So we need to balance that out with a lot of work on building community so generating a global shared sense of global ownership and and feedback mechanisms at a human at a human level also with the ability to orchestrate different units to rebundle because essentially what we're doing in this is unbundling uh, what would be a traditional organization design we're breaking it down into these individual microservices micro units where buying and selling from each other. So then we need to also learn how to orchestrate these different units without top-down management, but rather as these strategies very emergent, then how do we do to coordinate between them? And a lot of that can be done with uh, centralized or, or multi-centric planning in that you can, you can do it a little bit the way it happens in politics where you have think tanks that go and research an issue and provide a report so they don't force anyone to to abide by the report but they provide really strong arguments and some form of lobbying and, and essentially promote an idea and, and a bit of research of like hey this is a really good way to go how about we go that way so you have a combination of sort of community management plus uh, a meritocracy of ideas in an ideal world, or at least the sort of uh, signaling, I call, I call it a lighthouse or management by lighthouse quite often, where you're trying to signal, hey, this is the landscape, this is how the market looks, these are some opportunities, and then you hope that people will go and pursue them. So you're just shining a light upon them and then helping to broker uh, different collaborations in between the units as a way to make strategy. So that's kind of like the, the orchestration capability, which is not necessarily easy to do, but I think that can be developed. Then 
you need to develop quite a bit of a capability around contracting and service level agreements because you want to reduce the the cost of transaction the coordination costs because if you look at like the basic theory of the firm quite often people say it's like well if instead of buying and selling from each other they need to collaborate and the cost of buying and selling are too big then it makes more sense to aggregate under the same umbrella and so on and 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 so this capability about contracting and service level agreements is primarily uh, designed to create methodologies and practices and a culture that enables these different units to create effective relationships of mutual benefit between them and then the last bit is the platform governance as then you have all of these different units operating between them but you want to have a, a, a set of shared rules and still a few shared capabilities, essentially the platform upon which these different units are operating, or if you like the commons that these different units are relying upon, and you need to have some form of governance to operate in those. So as far as uh, platform governance, and this is the last bit I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, and then maybe we open it up. I would love to hear what you, you folks uh, think about this stuff. But so in terms of platform governance, and this touches upon a little bit the meta governance and organization design, um, what we're getting is the, the basic vo community voting, so direct democracy mechanism. Some of the challenges that we have is that it, we have low context and not necessarily uh, an attribution of expertise. There is no necessary continuity as people might vote on one proposal, but they don't necessarily read the next or they don't know what the outcome of this proposal was in a way that is going to inform their next decision. Uh, equally, attention management is a challenge. Do you, how much participation should you get in every proposal? Not all decisions are equally impactful. So how can you signal that something is worth more attention than the other? Uh, populism that we already discussed. The, the thing that is really, really good, though, is the direct signaling, because people are directly saying, I agree or disagree. Does this essentially helps further my interest or not? Um, and so that's a quite a bit positive here. But the other issue is because we're talking about large crowds and numbers of people, then deliberation is quite hard. And this is at the moment somewhat attempted in forums and so on, but none of those tools are actually organized like feeds, whether they're Discord or a forum feed, they're not designed to enable a large group of people to effectively have a conversation and clearly uh, clearly figure out this is the things we agree on this is the ones we dis we disagree on here is where we need where we have a complex problem and we need some solution that can bridge the gap in between what we agree and disagree and try to resolve the paradoxes and let's ideate and so on the the tools that we have are really not set up for that and because this historically we've just been resolving this by delegating to a sm very small number of people whether a ceo or executive board and so on so we're not particularly good at this uh, even though we're learning quickly but deliberation is still quite a challenge then with with delegates which is now becoming the the more popular uh, answer to the to this issue and whether the base is representative democracy we are solving somewhat the the context issue in that you have some delegates, they specialize in that, they're going to be more immersed. You solve somewhat the continuity is issue, they have focused attention to this thing, and then it's relatively easy to say, oh, well, you you have the group of delegates, you're going to be more focused in this area, and you, the other half of delegates, you're going to be a little bit more focused on that area. That sort of happens organically between them in general. Uh, problematically, still super, super populist, and we have had b many bad situations with ENS and some some others where people get elected and then they never showed up, or essentially people are saying it's mostly the influencers who are being elected, and so that issue is still not solved. Uh, we reintroduce principal agent problems, so the the delegates ha have their own agenda, their own desires, their own aspirations, which might not quite correlate with the broader community, and so they might take advantage of their position and essentially what you end up is an organization that's been captured by a by an elite and we're back to uh traditional corporations and the old world and all the dirty things in politics and we haven't actually solved any of that uh but then there are some possibilities for deliberation at least because it's a smaller group so even though it's not super designed for that 
depending on the decision-making processes that you put between delegates and so on, there is some possible deliberation. So because of these challenges now, so a lot of the researchers in, in democracy and so on, and this is mostly coming from outside of, of Web3, but one of the popular solutions has been the, the citizen assemblies, which is a, it works a little bit like the, the jury in a, in a judicial court, that there is a group of citizens who are drawn at random. These, so these are uh, regular members of the community who are selected at random. So there is no way for bribing. There is no way for uh, populism and, and things like that. And then they're asked to decide on, uh, on the topic of hand. And so the benefit of that is that they're not necessarily have expertise, but there has been some very, very successful experiments in France and some others where experts advise the citizens. Is again, this, the same way if you've seen a lot of uh, American movies about the jury, you have the members of the jury who are just citizens, and then you have the lawyers who are representing the different perspectives, and they're giving a lot of insights and, and points to the, to the citizens to consider. So you can have that same pattern of experts advising non-expert decision-making, which still need to be literate enough to understand the topic, but they definitely don't need to be experts in it. And, 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 and thanks to that and dedicating enough time into it, they can gain enough context to have some relatively effective decision-making. It offers some continuity, but not a lot in the sense that they are immersed in the topic for a bit, uh, but it's clearly not the, the same group of people who are gonna stay there for a very long time, because otherwise we're back to the model above, which is delegates. And offers focused attention, as I was saying, small group, no populism. Um, I hope that's fairly self-evident, but if not, let me know. In theories, he, when he's done with uh, a group that's large enough, it is statistically significant, so it can be representative and so on. So also you don't have direct signaling, you have something that is fairly close and can work fairly well. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. And is very deliberative by design and quite often the, the way these uh, processes are structured is very much taking into account the facilitation because you don't have a group of, let's say, expert managers or expert decision makers. You have a group of regular people. So you create a process that is robust enough so they can reach uh, a decision. And there is already a series of practice for this, but it's still a big, big room for, for improvement in, in tooling and processes and systems and the cultures we have about this. And then the, the other option that uh, we're looking into that is quite interesting is the idea of the multi-stakeholder delegation, which for those of you familiar with this is a combination of liquid democracy and fair shares. So liquid democracy, is essentially when I delegate my vote to someone and they can delegate to someone else. And it's a fantastic model for discovering local maxima in, in a very organic way and for leveraging trust networks and local accountability in that, for, like, for example, the, the way it works with, with movies is you don't necessarily know who is the person in your city who has the best taste in movies which would be the equivalent of selecting a delegate. And you might not know which is the best movie of all because you're not an expert in movies, which would be the equivalent of direct democracy. Uh, but you need to select which movie to produce and watch. And, and so if you're going to select which movie to watch, quite often you know which among your friends have a taste that somewhat aligns with yours, and they are usually more into movies than you are. So you're gonna ask for their opinion and you go and ask for their opinion. But then they, this person in turn, your friend who is more into movies than you are, will have more knowledge about which other people know more about movies than they do, but still somewhat aligned with the criteria and values that they have. And so they will ask the other friend about it. And and then that other friend maybe is hardcore into movies and is, is a film buff and knows all the directors and will actually follow. So through that chain of delegation, that chain of trust, you're being uh, you're getting some connection to actually quite a lot of expertise, 
without you even knowing directly that path. And it can be the same thing about food. You ask your friend who asked your who asked the foodie friend, who asked the friend who's a chef, and so on. And so you can use that that pattern to ex to in a in a network, in a decentralized manner to identify expertise. But then the the other the, the other issues with liquid democracy and so on is that you can still be fairly prone to to populism or at least tyranny of the major the majority in in that a lot of the votes are delegated to some people and they can just crush the minority and not take their interest into account and and so with the issue of essentially most voting systems is that it's very much just like who can who, who can brute force a proposal through and there is not necessarily a lot of uh, deliberation or win-win ideation that is included into it so that's where the the fair shares mechanism comes into into account and fair shares that is a, a pattern that started in the cooperative world is actually a model there and was created to make cooperatives investable and so the idea was that you could define different stakeholder classes so for example you have your workers you have your investors you have your suppliers you have your users and so on and each of these stakeholder classes has the same voting power irrespective of how much capital each class has invested because as we know the investors invest a lot more capital than probably all any of the other classes so the so because you distribute power between them Within each class, you can have a you can have a difference of the the, the voting power or decision making power that each individual has, but the class as a whole is still protected versus the the other classes. So you could, for example, still have within the investor class, it still be fairly plutocratic. And for investors, that makes some sense. I mean, you could apply some quadratic weighting or something like that if you want, but still roughly you want that the more money someone invests, the more they count as an investor because you're trying to incentivize people to invest more money. And again, you can adjust it, but in that class, it sort of makes sense. While in the worker class, you can use a different, uh, a, di a different mechanism and you don't necessarily need to then try to create a perfect equivalence of like how much funding equals how much decision power for someone who's providing labor, for someone who's a supplier or for someone who's a an user and so on. But you can sort of protect the decentralization by doing this as opposed to what uh, happens at the moment that people create a token, they distribute it and sure they can give some token to their to the workers and some token to the users, but the workers and the users, they have to pay bills, they're probably gonna sell the token, those tokens are gonna be bought by investors and before we realize, we'll have again some hedge funds and so or and, and, and some private funds who have acquired most of the tokens and are the ones controlling it. And the whole decentralization that we attain through or exit to community has quickly disappeared. So Fashes serves a little bit as an antidote to that that offers some context in that at least people are geared within the, the stakeholder classes. And if you can have some liquid delegation within those classes then that improves the context they can offer some continuity as well some level of focus attention again kind of like by the same properties in that you can have some sort of delegates like liquid let's say liquid delegates that are still within their their class so they can follow from round to round or cycle to cycle there is uh, unfortunately some populism here but less so it has the advantage of direct signaling and it offers some possibilities for deliberation because at least it facilitates to understand the, the incentives of some of the people aligned depending on their stakeholder classes and you can design your stakeholder classes any, any way you want and so on. So, so now what we are what we're looking into and is still to, to early stage to to give you a, a more simplistic uh, pattern or way of like hey this is the mechanism we created that'd be lovely but now we're mostly looking at a combination of the bottom two and we are starting a, a big research initiative it's actually a unit within within Arundel in collaboration with one of the largest networks of democracy researchers and trying to figure out some pattern for small team decision making and figuring out how we can use mechanisms where we we delegate decisions for at the local level but then those decisions can escalate into cities and assemblies if they are contentious and 
that's roughly the the direction we're going while for the financial uh, financial governance we mostly distribute it to the teams we have these unit to unit budget allocation and so on so it's kind of like creating a, a micro economy within what we're doing uh, building all of those cap capabilities and then uh reducing quite a bit the number of decisions that need to happen at the platform level at the at the meta governance level but and creating some very robust processes to do that that are probably slow and heavy or at least a lot heavier and so on but it's precisely because they're not focused for operational governance while the at, while the attention and the creation of units can still be somewhat regulated by the community deciding on whether they invest in certain units and how the the real state of uh, let's say discord channels or notion space or whatever other sort of forum and so on where lists of units are created you can still focus attention in different units so you still have some level of, let's say of top down governability to to facilitate strategy or at least to point to certain lighthouses or to certain bodies of work and reflection and thinking that can help to facilitate coordination but it's done in a very light uh, light touch way so, uh, yeah. so i'm gonna leave it at that and i'm curious yeah hi so you mentioned a couple of things um right. well you mentioned a ton of stuff <laughs> principles of subsidiarity yeah. um COSA's theory of the firm uh creating internal markets. And I guess the first question that I got to was, you, and you touched on this with the SLAs, is how how are you balancing creating the internal frictions of a, a marketplace inside of these um, with new negotiation events? Are you allowing for, for the possibility of choosing outside goods? How are you choosing a numerator? What what information are you gathering to to show revealed preferences between these groups? And how do you deal with things like long long range value? So if, uh, if you have a group who is educating, right, and another mm -hmm. group who is in operations, how are you managing those things with a long feedback mechanism like education for people to understand when the value is being created? Um, and, and measuring that value and giving attribution for the people that created it at the time that they did, but only being able to measure it at a later, at a much, much later date. So uh, I, I'm, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, What's the literature? Yeah, but, That's what I should ask. Where, where do I go to read it? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, those are uh, a, a lot of questions. Let me see. Let me try to answer. And, and if I forget any, uh, just please stop me and, and go for it. But in, in terms of um, friction in between them, mm -hmm. the, the idea is that the, let's say the, the umbrella, the platform can invest in the units as much as the units co-own the, the platform. So that creates a first incentive alignment, like some level of win-win-ness, plus the fact that you have a shared brand, and that generally a lot of the intellectual capital uh, in, uh, ip and so on that you're generating like all the learnings and so on they are open and we are encouraging uh, a, a strong culture of sharing and so on uh, around these things because they benefit the whole organization and also the units they are in a let's say in a more market position the contributors themselves are not necessarily in that situation the contributors are more operating in a network that is more enmeshed because they are part of multiple units most of them and and so that quite that shifts the the logic quite a bit from what feels like a market uh, in that oh i don't want to give money to these agency sort of thing but if someone is part of both the agency and the unit he, the logic sort of changes and it, it makes it complicated and messy, but it sort of works, uh, which is the, the wonder of it is that it's somewhat self-regulating. You can obviously have all sorts of back patterns and so on, but in a broad picture sense, it works. Then in, in terms of the, the contracting, it's really about culture and training 
and creating template agreements. Like at the beginning, and we are super, super early stage at the beginning, it is very hard. It is really a lot of work mm -hmm. to start to develop the, the different patterns and ballparks and figuring out how to value anything. But it's the same issue that you have if you're trying to allocate top down what's the value of something. Uh, once you start to have those reference points and start to have some templates of different agreements that have been created into units, the whole thing starts to roll and, and smooth out. And that's why it's kind of like entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship is that like at the beginning, you're trying to find product market fit and figuring out what your offering is and how you're supporting and how do you interact with your customers and so on. Except that here, everyone kind of has a, a vested interest in the like, a more clearly aligned vested interest in the development of the ecosystem. Uh, that's kind of like the interest of still doing it within an organization as opposed to purely separate DAOs transacting between them. And, and so that helps to facilitate a little bit the idea of like the client is going to figure out the service provider, how to service them a little bit more. So uh, on, on, it, on that topic in particular, though, is um, if everyone's a free agent yeah. and you are, there's two questions. One is how, how disassociated, like where's the limitation where I go between a market internal market economy down and versus a command and control? Because I think what you're saying is each of these units are operating as a small startup. Mm -hmm. Is that a startup of one? Is that a startup of two? Is that a startup of 100? So where, where does that naturally occur? And, and yeah. when do you know you've gone down too far? And then the second is, and I'm sorry, this isn't really a combined question. The second is, is what, what prevents you from, or what prevents them from basically seceding from the DAO, so to speak? And if, because if they've created this business unit that's, that's successful, is the ultimate goal for them to spin off? It is. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 is, it is precisely, well, I mean, ultimate goal as in is something we encourage. It mm -hmm. is not necessarily ideal for every unit, but while other DAOs are, are afraid, and I had this when, when I was with Aragon, there was like the customer, the tech support that was created internally. And then the tech support people were like, oh, we're a sub DAO. What if we start offering tech support services to other organizations? Because they sure. had this insight that actually they were mostly supporting people with integration. So they were already supporting them tech support for other tools. And, and then they, uh, you know, some of the, the central centralized team people freaked out and they had all sorts of fears and and then they, they stopped them from doing that, which meant that the people sort of disengaged, the performance of the unit went down, mm -hmm. and then eventually someone else outside started uh, what is now becoming a fairly successful uh, tech support uh, service provider uh, with some AI thingies. And I, I don't know what technology they're building, but they're doing fairly well. And essentially, so, Aragon what, passed on a business opportunity. On, on that piece, what yep. prevents, so if, if they can leave, which is fine, I don't, but where is the ability to, for the, the early investors to, to benefit from the value that's created and continue to benefit if, if they desire with that sub DAO that spins off, right? So, yeah, yeah. so we, it's, it's essentially because the, the, the parent organization, like the umbrella platform, whatever you want to call it, the, the main DAO, whatever, it still, owns um, a percentage of the, the subunit. And what we have is two-sided agreements. And, and this is where the, the governance of the thing becomes tricky and why we're interested in doing this research on multi-stakeholder governance or multi-factor voting, because uh, at the end, uh, the stakeholder classes, you account them by, um, well, by what we call a factor, but it's like, let's say how much you invested. So token holding is a factor. A reputation can be another factor, but that reputation can account for labor provision while token yeah. holding can account for investment and so on. So it, at that point where we're trying to figure out is uh, a governance mechanism where, where, the different, where one of the different classes is the umbrella organization for the, the subunits. 
and and there is some uh, i mean the equivalent of an equity exchange yeah. is not necessarily equity it could be tokens or something like that yeah because you use the word owns but it strikes me as owns might not be the right word it is not it's i'm, I'm using it as a as a proxy okay i'll, I'll be quiet because other people likely want to talk <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to mention, like, if you have a question, uh, we want to, you know, have continuous discussion, definitely support that, but also make sure that everyone who has question can raise it. So, uh, Abhishek, I think you you were next. No, I was just kind of uh, adding to the discussion. I think, uh, yeah, I think your name's N, but he had all the questions I had regarding the presentation, you know, and it, I don't see how we can just be so, uh, we can just accept for all these sub DAOs to just kind of uh, transition away from the DAO so easily, right? I mean, if we were to take, uh, I mean, let's just take the DAO as in the EU. Okay, let's just, uh, we're not getting into politics, but just as a hypothetical example, you know, and you have these major sub DAOs come into play. And let's be honest, out of all the sub DAOs that exist, uh, if you take Pareto's principle, 80 to 80% 80 of the value is uh, kind of within certain core uh, subunits. Now, if you kind of make, see, at the end of the day, the DAO as a collective is supposed to, uh, you have all these sub DAOs, they're supposed to serve the broader collective itself. Even though you have this sort of independent mind uh, think, uh, coming into play, they're supposed to serve the collective. But what happens when you kind of make that sort of in, uh, independence happen is that somewhere tribalism does happen within these subunits and when they do uh, decide to take the opportunity to walk away how do you put in those processes where that impact to the DAO doesn't become a problem you know say that uh, as you mentioned Daniel uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, the Aragon aspect the tech support sub DAO uh, pivoted away uh, they didn't get to pivot but should have pivoted away for, uh, to becoming a a unit, uh, what are the processes that they should have kept in place to allow for a good transition? And you can also have, uh, you know, uh, probably uh, the way you see succession planning. When somebody decides to leave, you have like a three month tenure where somebody else could be brought into the place. Uh, and that, uh, what are the sort of processes that you could bring into place? How do you kind of transition these people into the culture and the collective itself? and uh, the investment part because you mentioned the investment aspect also that investment is being siphoned out so now you need that uh, you need to bring in people to kind of figure out how to bring in as part of the culture but to invest also to kind of allow for that uh, um, two way street doesn't that kind of uh, increase the uh, the the whole transition aspect itself yeah, so I mean, the, the first thing to like, I, I would put a couple of caveats. One is that the social layer is actually an extremely powerful regulator for a lot of these things, uh, even if the incentive structure really allows them to spin out and so on. You still have loads of relationships and bonds. And this is the bit of like having really real community as like sense of belonging and ownership that need, really needs to be cultivated for the thing to work and not to become brutal free market capitalism the the other bit is that because what the dao has a consistent need in the scenario we're talking about like let's say aragon continue to require customer support services if that has value for aragon aragon can provide uh, value for that so there is no reason for this tech support unit to walk away from a business opportunity. There is still a budget there that they could use for themselves. So they only if they really decide to pivot, if they find a way bigger opportunity, would they stop providing those services to Aragon. The other thing is the competition principle in that every unit within the network needs to be enabled to also use third party suppliers, because otherwise you're essentially creating an internal monopoly and that's tremendously dysfunctional. And that's the issue with a lot of corporations with shared services is that the shared services is a monopoly. And so they give you shit service for whatever budget they're getting, but you can do nothing to actually impact and improve that quality and demand what you need for your own unit to succeed. So in this case, if 
let's say if this unit had started providing the Aragon unit had actually spin out and started or semi spin out and started taking on other clients and then Aragon was unhappy, they could go and hire a competitor. And you actually want to create redundancy within the system to make it resilient. It's, this is not a system that is geared towards efficiency. If what you're uh, uh, trying to get is efficiency, this organization design is a disaster. What this organization design is really good at doing is at is spotting new opportunities and adapting really, really fast. So it's useful when you're in a high uncertainty environment, like I would argue is web free and DAOs in particular as a market is like changing crazy fast. So you're optimizing for, for that, not optimizing for efficiency. If your business model is efficient, <laughs> then this is not, not working because precisely the cost of redundancy, the cost of switching and so on will, will kill you. More than the value of, let's say this unit becoming super successful, but it's, it's kind of like being an incubator in a way, is if these units go and become a big business and Pareto law, as you were saying, some will make it, some will not. Uh, but if the ones that make it really well, at the end, financially, the organization is becoming very successful and brand wise can become very successful, even if, yes, it does mean that sometimes you're losing your service, pro your internal service provider because they walk away and that can create some level of disruption. Great answer. I would just add that NounsDAO, I think, has a very similar business model because they are funding projects which will not really like give them direct revenue back, but basically just expand the community and just like you know making the brand which will indirectly support the, the original DAO. So I think this is very interesting how this is actually happening uh, kind of in real time nowadays. Sean, uh, you are next. Yeah. Okay. All right. Just a quick one for you. So, Daniel, I think you mentioned last week in a tweet that you guys were starting on this research that you briefly just mentioned, and I think that's your decision-making research. How can we, um, as governance nerds, get involved in the work that you're doing? Because I've got kind of like I'm interested in, it, but I also want to try and get some of my questions answered too in that research. So how how can we get involved in your and in helping you? Um, so, I mean, there is different ways. One, if you have the bandwidth just join the unit. Uh, a lot of these units are open for joining, like uh, Fims was hanging out with us a little bit today and uh, speaking with James and so on. Uh, so you folks are super welcome. The The other thing uh, is we're starting a research a ton uh, sort of project. So think about the hackathon, but research oriented because we're seeing that there is a lot of essentially shit that comes out of hackathons because people haven't researched and understood the problem. They go, they prototype really quickly, it's fun, they build relationships, they have a great time, but it's not creating sustainable teams and sustainable businesses. So we wanted to first uh, organize it so people learn that share open source, the teams get gain the prestige and the deep insights that put them in an ideal position to then go and prototype if they want. Uh, and we're going to be launching that soonish so you folks can also participate in that and then i was actually discussing with uh themes uh, uh the other day suggesting that actually this initiative that's happening here is pretty awesome and the community that's gathering and maybe there are ways we can collaborate with r and maybe like make these part of that initiative because on one side we'll have like the deep researchers who are a very significant portion of their time but they need very close contact with those who are let's say more in the operating or learning phase and and if we can create those two units that really collaborate with each other that would be amazing and and that's kind of that would be the let's say the the trial by fire of of whether this very open distributed model but hopefully very collaborative can actually work perfect uh, thank you Daniel. actually uh, i i I want to be mindful of time. We have, uh, we are at the time, uh, but I will want to give you also one maybe last minute if you have like final thoughts. It almost looked like you already gave it to us, but if you have any final thoughts, and then I, uh, you know, can stop the recording. And if anyone want to hang longer, uh, you are welcome. Yeah, I'm. I mean, I'm. I'm gonna go. It's 10 p.m. here, and I haven't had dinner. But thank you, thank you very much for the the really amazing questions. I I would love to continue the conversation. Uh, so if anyone uh, wants to reach out, I'm leaving my Twitter there, and I think Fims already shared the the link for the. Uh, ah, yeah, the the link for the Notion page of the unit. Uh, if you go to uh, Arendal, I'm putting the, the Twitter bit here. 
in you can also there find the link to our Discord in the bio of of Arendao, uh, or you know reach out in any way. Like I would love to continue this conversation. Thank you all very much. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Uh, it was an amazing presentation. A really gr uh, great thinking. I uh, really love it. Actually, I have tons of other questions. We just couldn't uh, make it. So let's uh, stay in touch. Like, you know, r and and our uh, governance nurse group. We are still figuring out how we will call ourselves. So uh, <laughs> bear with us. Uh, and yeah, thank you. Thank you all uh, for being here. And see you next Monday 2 p.m. EFC. We will be talking about quadratic voting with Scott from Gitcoin. Thank you all.